Thank you. So the year was 2000 um, when I found myself uh, at Los Angeles International Airport um, awaiting a flight to New York when uh, United Airlines, my airline that I have a million miles with, decides to change airplanes and they announce uh, suddenly we've changed airplanes and you, your seating is wide open and we're, you're just going to have to pick whatever seat you want. And uncharacteristically, I was the last guy on the airplane. I'm usually early. And the only seat left was next to a large guy in the back row. And uh, I enjoyed what everybody else missed out on by not sitting next to this guy. It was one of the great turning points in my life, what we now call an inflection point, where the path of my life changed. The guy's name was Shio Ajaboye. He was from Nigeria. He's a, uh, a theologian, a pastor. He was on his first trip to the U.S. He spoke in eight languages or something. He just finished translating the Bible to Yoruba, which is his native language. And we did this thing where you do when you're sitting at a, a long flight with somebody who's interesting and you just sort of talk for a while and what you do, what I do. And he told me these interesting things he was doing. And then he asked me, what are you doing? And I said, well, I was on this, I was in a book junket. I had just come out uh, with a book that I co-authored, which uh, Elf mentioned, called The Clue Train Manifesto. It was already a business bestseller. It was coming out in nine languages. It's still a, a, a sells very well. It was a successful book. And I was proud of it. And he said, well, like, do you have it with you? I said, yeah. And I showed it to him. He said, well, what, what, what's your part of this? And I showed him a chapter that I had mainly written called Markets Are Conversations. And that's the most quotable line, the most quoted line from Clue Train, Markets Are Conversations. And, and I'll go to my grave as the guy who kind of foisted that onto marketing, because all the marketers are now talking about, we're doing conversation with you and all that kind of stuff. There's a bazillion companies selling markets being conversations. But what Shio said to me then was, you know, that's, that's pretty smart for a, you know, a middle class guy from the first world, but where I come from, that's the most obvious thing there is. Um, uh, we, I, I come from a, a land with natural markets where the, there, is no, there are no brands, there are no names inside clothing, and there are no, um, no price, pricing guns that that the vendor goes around and marks everything with. You discover the price, in fact, inside a conversation. He said, but you don't know enough about that, so let me, let me, uh, let me ask you, do you want to go any deeper? And I said, sure. He said, and so he turned into Socrates then, and he said, okay, well, let's say you are in a market, a natural market in the third world, and, um, and you go to a stall, you see a garment, and he picks up one of those those uh, pillows that looks like a bad sponge and, and says, well, let's say this is a garment and you like this garment. And uh, what do you say to the vendor? And I said, what does it cost? He said, yes, you would say that. Because you come from a, the first world where price is everything and all of your, all of your uh, business schools are all about pricing and understanding pricing, but only one side sets the price. And, it's, and so, so we said, so what, what's, you know, what happens then if you have a real conversation? You talk about markets being conversations. What happens if you have one of these conversations? And after 20 minutes, you've talked to each other about your lives, and he's, the vendors told you all about um, uh, where this thing came from, the artist who made it, the dyes that were used, the animals that provided the wool or whatever it was, and the, whatever the fashions were behind it. And, and he's found out a lot about you, where you came from, what you're doing in his village or at this marketplace. and and. And so he learns a lot about you, you learn about him. After 20 or 30 minutes of this, what happens to the price? And I said, well, I guess I would be willing to pay more. He'd be willing to charge less. He said, yes. What do you have now that you didn't have before? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> um, I didn't prove myself very smart there, but he, he said, you have a relationship. This is foreign to you in your culture and in your economy where where he said in every marketplace in every in every economy there are always three things that are at play one is conversation one is transaction and one is relationship and he said in your culture transaction is the biggest part if you look at it as a pyramid transaction goes across the bottom everything sits on top of that 
you understand it terribly well. There's this gigantic vocabulary and all the business schools teach all about transaction. Conversation is a smaller part and relationship is actually the smallest part of that. And he said it, it exists, but in your culture, often what will happen if you actually do have a conflict, relationship doesn't sustain it. What'll happen is somebody will say, well, it all comes down to the bottom line and you'll make a choice based on that and screw each other because relationship is so weak. He said it's actually the opposite with us. Relationship is almost everything and transaction is the last thing that happens. It's one of the smallest things. And you, he said, my assignment to you was to learn more about relationship. He also said that there are two moralities at play here and it's important to understand them because they are completely different. One is the morality of transaction. The morality of transaction is like the scales of justice. You, you, you pay for your crimes, you owe favors to each other. And that's an important part of civilization. But there's another one, which is the morality of relationship. And the morality of relationship is all about generosity. You can't bring price into it. What, what happens is with, with your spouse and with your children is that you don't put a price on that. As soon as you put a price on it, or you bring price into it, you put a, a, a measure on love or caring, you cheapen it and you move it into this transactional space where it really doesn't belong. And we're always working both of these things. And those things are always at play in a natural marketplace. So what happened, what he described there was what we lost when industry won the industrial revolution 150 years ago. What we had were markets that were powered by people. They're still out there. But we live in an industrial age, and we live in this industrial world, a transaction-based world, not a relationship-based world, that in which technology powers everything, and in which big companies have the most power because they have the most technology. And that has been our assumption over the last 150 years. But there has been a change over the last 30 years or so with a series of revolutions that have taken place, of which the final one is the one we're in now. So I want to put that in, the pers in, in perspective. Let's say the year is 1983. And you are what we then called an MIS director, and now we call an ICT or an IT director at a large company. In 1983, if you were asked would you let PCs in this organization, personal computers? Personal computers are still new. They came out in 1970-something, the early Apples and Radio Shacks and Sinclairs and Osbournes and so on. But the IBM PC had come out in 1982. And here was something that was an oxymoron at the time. Personal computing was like personal blimp or personal high-rise building or personal spaceship or personal moon. It made no sense. This is something only big companies had computing. And it cost millions of dollars, these things. And, but here were these personal computers coming in. If you were asked, would you let those in your company, you would probably say no. In fact, you did say no. That was the job back then. But what happened over the next several years were spreadsheets and word processing and accounting programs and so forth. And all of a sudden, that anybody with a spreadsheet could do a better job with numbers inside the company than the big accounting packages and finance packages could running batch processing using COBOL and all that kind of stuff. And it became necessary in the next several years to have PCs on everybody's desk. What happened there was that people, individuals could do something that was formerly entirely the province of the corporation or of the government or the, whatever the large organization was. We got this power to compute and we weren't giving it back. That was the first revolution. Now let's go forward to 1995. And in 1995, the internet had already been around for a long time in one form or another, but it was mostly inside universities and large companies and governments. But what happened was ISPs showed up, internet service providers, and we had our first graphical browsers from Netscape and then Microsoft and others. And we had email that was a kind that that was open and free, and, and we had the ancestor of open source, which is called free software, um, which is still around by that name. But all of these tools were coming into use, and we could now do dial-up and get onto the net. Anybody could get onto the net. But if you were asked if you were an IT director in 1996, would you let people in your organization use the internet? 
you would say, no, why would we do that? We, we have lands, we have Novell, we have 3Com, we have, you know, we have these, we, we control networking here, we know how to do it, don't worry about it. We have our own messaging system, you know, we have our own phone system, if you want to call internationally, you do it through our system. But what happened over the next several years was the dot-com revolution, as we know, and suddenly we had the power to communicate internationally where all of us were zero distance from each other. That's what the internet did. And it did it with a protocol, nothing but a protocol. A protocol is just handshakes between machines and between nodes on a, on a network. And it was built, the internet was built on these protocols, which are manners, ways of getting along, ways of sharing. All we're doing when we send a file is sharing it. We're keeping our copy and we're sharing it with somebody else. That's, that was a new thing that gave us the power to communicate that was formerly, again, something that was organizational alone. So those are two revolutions that weren't going to change, computing and then communications. Now let's jump forward to, say, 2008. We have smartphones now. We have iPhones. We have Androids. If you were to ask an IT director in 2008, are you going to let people bring their own device and do corporate stuff on their mobile phone? They would say, no, no, wait a minute. We have Blackberries. We're going to give you guys Blackberries. You know, you, you, would, you could bring your iPhone if you want, but your Blackberry, we, we, we have the corporate Blackberry. Don't worry about it. Now, a few years later, all those companies, the big ones especially, are writing programs for their people to use on their iPads and iPhones and Androids. So what happened there was that the power to communicate and the power to compute were suddenly put in our pockets and we had mobility. So that's a third revolution that wasn't going back. So now we're in a fourth one. We're in the middle of a fourth one right now. All of you have heard the term big data. Big data is being promoted very heavily. If you're an IT manager now, you're looking over at this new character called the chief marketing officer. The chief marketing officer has a bigger budget than you do. And inflating that budget are IBM and Microsoft and SAP and Siemens and a whole bunch of other companies, Oracle, selling big data solutions. This, the sounds that they're making with that are very much like the sounds that the mainframe industry made in the early 1980s and the land industry made in the middle of the 1990s and that the Blackberry type people were saying in the, in the late aughts, which is we can do it better. And, and you'll hear this too. We know you better than you know yourselves. You know, we, you don't have to do anything. We're, we're following you around. This is good for you. We're going to make better offers to you. You, the consumer, all you're going to do is consume, and we're just going to, we've, we've got it all figured out for you. That is the sound of mainframes talking and of an old mentality. Now, here's the thing. We are going to be able to do more with our data than they could. <laughs> than the big organizations can. That is, the, that is the fight that's going on right now. Though it doesn't look so much like a fight, it will be. We're gonna be able to do more with that, just like we did more with computing, and just like we did more with communications. And now it comes, now, and, what, and what happened in the course of that is that what in the, we're in the industrial age, we had technology, markets run by technology. Now we're going to have markets run by both technology and by people. And the people are the ones in this room, and the people are the ones that are, that are learning again for the industries we work for and the industries that we're putting out of business, the industries we're putting into business by sharing with each other and understanding what data was in the first place, which is something that essentially wants to be shared. The internet is a copy machine, Kevin Kelly says. We can't put that one back in the bottle. So I was, I was thinking as I've been sitting here for the, for the, last, uh, for the last day of just some, some of the things that we, that we talk about, you know, and these are all, you know, the, the maker movement, um, uh, fab labs, liquid organizations, crowdfunding, all the aspirational stuff that we're putting on the board out front, open science, the commons, co-everything, virtual currencies, urban farming. I mean, all of these things are, in fact, the rise in the power of individuals. And this is really important. We tend to think that because we've been in this era we've called social for the last several years, that this is a social revolution, and it is. But what makes us most human is that we are all different. 
we are, we are not the same. We are born different. We have different, not only different DNA, we just have different souls. Two identical twins that started out as the same egg have separate and very individual souls. And there are things that only we can bring. This was so fascinating to me yesterday in listening to Dale talk about the maker movement. It's, you give these, the box to kids, they'll all cut that box up differently. They all want to bring something different. It's our differences that make life rich and interesting, and that is what we are recovering right now. For 150 years, we've had industry telling us, you're all the same, we're gonna treat you as a mass market. We are disabling that gradually right now. The open source movement is part of that, co-everything is part of that, and we are all part of that, and we're teaching our, the, the culture and the economy while we're teaching each other, and so that's the context I wanna put this in, and thank you very much. I have four minutes left. Do you want to do Q&A? Is that a possibility? Okay, good. Are there any cues out there? I have a microphone here, so. This is so much like Europe. In the, in the US, like every hand goes up, you know. Uh, one, one, one second. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone. I like shouting. <laughs> What's the kind of main hindrance you see to this world coming about? What's the what? I'm sorry? The main hindrance. Hindrance. The main hindrance? Yeah. Um, well, just, you know, there's, it's, it's a Newtonian state. Bodies at rest tend to stay at rest. Um, so, you know, and, and bodies in motion tend to stay in motion. There's a bit of a collision going on. There's, um, there's always going to be resistance. Um, uh, my friend uh, uh, Larry Lessig, uh, the lawyer at, at, at Harvard who's uh, behind many good things, it says the future, the, pa the past always fights the future. You know, there's, uh, it's very easy to trivialize a lot of the things that are going on here. Um, we're, you know, everything, all this, all this sharing is disruptive. <laughs> it's disruptive to standing things. The interesting thing is what's happened before is that big business has discovered that individual empowerment, in fact, is good for it. But it's a discovery process. So. I, I, bet I tend to look at this very optimistically. I, I, I see that Dave Tat here in the front row. If you've heard about buffer bloat, by the way, very important thing. He's one of the kings of buffer bloat, one of the great creators of solutions. He's fixing the internet right now. Giving He's and giving away the fix. He came to our house and made our internet work much faster with a new gizmo that he set up. Um, Marcus Sabadello here in the, in the second row. Um, from Austria, but he'll be at eyes at almost every IW, doing miraculous new things. That, there's a whole new category I should, I should meant to mention, and now I will, um, called personal clouds. You know, right now, cloud, you say cloud, and it's always, that's yet again, it's, some, it's like the mainframe business, something only big companies have. We are all each going to have our own cloud. We don't have to have it on a computer, it can be on something, but we are going to have a cloud. So that is a big, a year from now, personal clouds will be a much bigger thing of part of what we're talking about here. Um, the Freedom Box, which uh, Marcus has worked on and many others, these are all part of it. There's a new device that Customer Commons that Joyce, my wife and I have been working on with a bunch of other people, has a new um, prototype device we want to start called an OMI. OMI is basically a handheld thing, open source, basically it'll run Android, but there's no phone company in it. What can you do when there's not a phone company in your phone? So, or your, your device. Well, you may think of, um, I mean, say, take wallets, for example. Google wants to give you a wallet and PayPal and all these other companies want to give you a wallet. You know, I have a wallet back here. It doesn't have anybody's name on it. This is mine, right? I could put other company stuff inside, but it's mine. Um, so what would our wallet look like? Well, we can imagine that if the phone company's not doing it or somebody else is doing it. So I guess the hindrance is just our own imaginations, which I think we're pretty good at dealing with that. Other questions? We've got one minute left. Over here, the orange shirt. One sec, one sec. I, can't, I won't be able to hear you, so. Yes, you identified four uh, revolutions, and um, we understand quite well what the three first ones are because we, we have experienced that. But what would it be exactly uh, if data become uh, personal, if people appropriate themselves uh, common data for what uses it would be and to, d to do what? Because the example you took about bypassing companies, uh, for instance, for paying or 
giving phone calls is one thing, but it's not a, a matter of data as such, a personal data. It's, diff it's different business you, you, model. a bit of microphone. Different yeah. business models. Okay. Um, in the little time I have, um, a really big one is, is, is the whole quantified self movement around our own health and fitness, fitness data. Right now, your Fitbit data and your uh, Nike data and your Withing Scale data and, and your Zio sleep monitor data are all in separate silos. Companies love making silos. You know, every time you log in with a separate login and password, that's a different silo you have to deal with. We are the only ones in a position to be the point of integration for data that's about us and the point of origination for what gets done with it. So, so health data and fitness data is a big one. Um, uh, ordinary things like our, our, our taxes, um, you know, everything that has to do with governance, for example, the, the, the My Data project in the UK, uh, Smart Disclosure in the US, there's similar ones in France and other countries where the g different government agencies that are all siloed are recognizing that, you know what, it's going to be easier for the citizen to change their address once with all of us than for us to federate all our systems that don't get along with each other. So, so that's, a, I mean, that's a case of actually very small data, but it's a huge cost. In the UK, for example, it costs a lot for the for National Health Service and the Royal Mail when they have the wrong address. And if you move or you change your last name or whatever else you do, um, you can, you know, if you do it once for all of them, then, you know, you get a re reformat of that. So those are two examples. But basically, if, if you think about all of the things that we're in the best position to know, it isn't a matter of big data, although there are things we can do with big data. It's just it's a matter of what can we do better than they can for the good of them and for us. So, thank you. And I think we're out of time now. Yeah. It thank you very much. Up. Okay, thank you. Uh, a round of applause. And public mentioned that we are having a session.